sexual exploitation. At least 60 million girls today are missing from various populations, mostly in Asia, as a result of infanticide, neglect, or gender-selected abortions. Between 100 and 140 million women and girls alive today have been subjected to genital mutilation. In six African countries, over 80% of women have been subject to this practice. And over 60 million girls worldwide are child brides where violence and abuse characterize their married life. Throughout history, women have been repeated targets of abuse and exploitation in a male-dominated world that often views women as inferior beings. And women living in the Roman Empire during the first century were particularly vulnerable and at risk uh, back then. Women back then had no rights, were considered property of their fathers or their husbands, which often exposed them to various forms of abuse. Last week in our Driven, drive by, Driven by Hope series, Drive by, Drive by Hope. <laughs> God, we could market that, you know? <laughs> Last week in our Driven by Hope series, we saw Peter addressing two other vulnerable and at-risk at groups in the Roman society, and we learned that in all of our relationships, we are to maintain a humble posture, a lower posture, a selfless posture, and we're to do it so that we don't tarnish God's gracious and loving reputation. I covered this in detail last week, so if you weren't here, I highly suggest that you watch it on our YouTube channel. We put all of our messages um, almost within a couple hours up on YouTube, and you can find them there at youtube.com uh, cornerstone, backslash Cornerstone Boulder CO. Uh, take a look. This week, the title of the message is called Lower Yourself for God's Sake, Part 2. Last week was Part 1. And we're going to see Peter addressing vulnerable and at-risk wives. But this time, he has something to say to their Roman husbands as well. So let's just jump in. Open up your Bibles, if you have one with you, to 1 Peter chapter 3. If you didn't bring one with you, uh, the verses will be up on the screen. And before we read this section, just like last week, I want to make it perfectly clear. You've got to get this, okay? No one should ever stay in an abusive situ relationship. There is no reason, there's no reason on earth to stay in an abusive relationship. Unlike Roman society, uh, we have laws that protect us from abuse. We have many resources available to help people in abusive relationship. If you are in that kind of an abusive relationship, whether you're a man or a woman, yes, it happens to men too, um, then please let us help you find a safe environment to grow and to heal so that you can become stronger and not get caught in that kind of situation again. So please reach out to someone here on staff. Let us help you. Uh, you can reach out to Mary Howard if you'd like. She's our counselor that's on staff, and she would love to meet with you and to walk through that with you. All right, here's our passage for today. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. And so it starts off by saying, likewise. So likewise, referring back to these persecuted believers and to these slaves. Likewise, wives. Be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious." For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And Brian Carlucci is going to come up and address these passages today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> these are, you know, already I'm, I'm sure some of you already pressed some buttons. You hear the word, you know, s subject yourself and you go, oh my gosh. And so I'm, I'm asking you to hang in there. Women particularly, you're going to come out looking really good today. So um, just know that at the beginning, all right? And also notice, notice how in the context of taking a, a low posture in marriage, 
Verse 5 says, this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. And then verse 6 says, do not fear anything that is frightening. And so the name of this series in 1 Peter is called Driven by Hope. And the contrast of a person driven by hope is a person that's driven by fear. You see, a person driven by fear responds to the frightening things in life in unhealthy and destructive ways, which is very damaging to the soul, that inner part of us that leads to an unsatisfying life. But a person driven by hope responds to the frightening things in life in healthy and constructive ways. And the result is a soul, an inner person, that prospers in any life situation. What frightening things were causing these women to cave into their fears? The unhealthy imbalance of power that existed in their marriages from a male-dominated Roman society. You see, the women in Sarah's day didn't cave into fear. They used to make themselves beautiful on the outside through the hope that they had in God on the inside. But this current generation of women was caving into their fears. They're trying, listen to this, they're trying to make themselves beautiful by verbally disrespecting their husbands and by dressing in provocative ways to get attention, get the attention of other men. Now, how do we know this? Because notice how Peter encourages these wives in verse 2 to have a respectful and pure conduct. In other words, respectful to their husbands and pure in their dress. Peter's not telling women that they can't look good. He's dealing with a particular issue here. Why? Why should women do this? In hopes of winning over their husbands to God's healthy way of marriage. These men were living outside of the, the ways that a, a man should treat a woman. And so this is what he's encouraged them to do. And so Peter is really trying to warn these wives not to let their good character be corrupted by their frightening marriage situations. These were beautiful women, inside and out, who were at risk of becoming something they never wanted or dreamed of. And Peter, in trying to prevent them from heading down a path that will ultimately damage their souls, he wants them to preserve their inner beauty that never speaks out in desperate words and never dresses up in desperate clothing. Fear causes us to do desperate things on the outside, but hope causes us to be at peace on the inside. And these vulnerable wives were losing hope. And then to their domineering husbands, Peter says, live with your wives in an understanding way and honor them as the weaker vessel. In other words, Peter's saying, don't view your wives as property. They are not your property. See them as the priceless human beings God created them to be. And don't use your strength, don't use your manpower as a way to overpower and control your wives. Instead, honor them as an equal counterpart in your marriage. Now, even though both of you may be unequal in strength, you are both equal in God's eyes, and you must treat your wife as an equal, not as a piece of property. You tracking with me on this? All right, no one's got up and left yet. Now, you might think that none of this applies to us today because, well, we live in modern America, and that was ancient Rome, but unfortunately, many men today, and even many Christian men today, still view a woman's role in a marriage, not just a marriage, but we're talking about marriage today, as subservient to the husband's role. And this creates an imbalance of power as much in a marriage today as it did back then. And so I want to dig a little bit deeper into this topic for God's sake. And I want to begin by declaring that the Bible teaches that it's both the husband and wife who are to submit to each other, not just the wife submitting to her husband. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Messiah, which is just another way of saying, lower yourself for God's sake, right? And in reality, we're all supposed to maintain a humble posture in every relationship, but this is especially essential for a healthy marriage. Both the husband and the wife are to submit to each other. And this passage in Ephesians goes on to describe how they are to submit themselves to each other. And when I teach on this subject, I in inevitably get one perplexed, fearful husband who will come up to me and say, Hey, Rabbi, doesn't the Bible teach that the husband is the head of his wife? So what's all this talk about a husband submitting to his wife? 
And I will usually say something like, yeah, the Bible does teach that the man is the head of his wife, but headship is only meant to describe a man, how a man is supposed to submit to his wife, not how he is to dominate her. It is not a license to dominate a wife. Now, let me explain. If you recall in God's economy, if you want to be first, you have to be last. And if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. And if you want to be the head, you have to be, well, you have to be the rear. Yes, husbands, you literally need to be a butt head. You see, head in the Bible literally means beginning or first, like the head or the source of a river is the beginning of a river. And in God's topsy-turvy, upside-down, counterintuitive economy, if you want to be the beginning, then you have to be the end. And that's why when teaching husbands how to submit to their wives, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. See, listen to this. Jesus is undeniably the head of the church, isn't he? But as the head, he didn't use his position to overpower or over control or to oppress us. Instead, he lowered himself by putting an end to his life so that we could all begin to have a full and satisfying life. And husbands are to follow Messiah's example by being willing to lay down their own agendas in life in order to allow their wives to have a full and satisfying life of their own. And when you think about mutual submission between a husband and a wife this way, this doesn't lower the value of a woman. This raises it up to a value that is absolutely priceless. I mean, so many people today argue that the Bible's teaching on marriage is like stepping back into the Stone Age, but the Bible actually raises the value of women to their proper place by lowering the posture of both the husband and the wife in a marriage, which was not only revolutionary back in Roman society, in ancient Rome, it's revolutionary teaching even today where over 50% of our marriages fail. And that brings us to the second point in this message, which is to declare the Bible also teaches that husbands and wives are of equal value. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And so by saying that both men and women are created in God's image, it means that both men and women are of equal value which also means that we desperately need each other if we're ever going to comprehend the full nature of God. Let me explain this, and, and, and think about this for just a minute. If you were a woman who was dropped off on an island that was only inhabited by men, you would miss something about the nature of God that is uniquely feminine. Likewise, if you're a man who's dropped off on an island that was only inhabited by women, you'd not only be a lucky guy, <laughs> but you would miss something about the nature of God that is uniquely masculine. You see, God made men and women in his image, which means there's something about the nature of God that is defined by the unique attribute, attributes only found in a man and only found in a woman. So women, anytime you think that you can live without a man, think again. And men, anytime you think you can live without a woman, think again. Only together. Rach beyachad in Hebrew, right? Only together can we create a picture of God's full nature. And without each other, something about God's nature will be lacking in a marriage or to anyone who's looking inside of a marriage. You see, being made in the image of God is what makes a man's value and a woman's value equal to each other. Behavior doesn't raise or lower anyone's value. Status doesn't raise or lower anyone's value. 
Occupation doesn't raise or lower anyone's value. Ethnic origin doesn't raise or lower anyone's value. Gender doesn't raise or lower anyone's value. Age doesn't raise or lower anyone's value. Intelligence doesn't raise or lower anyone's value. And a disability doesn't raise or lower anyone's value. Raise your hand if you are a human being. Look how many people didn't raise their hands. That just scares me when you do that, you know? Do this. Can you do uh, I, yeah, All right, if you can do that, I want to see you after. If you raised your hand, you were made in the image of God. And this is where your value, your identity comes from. Now, unfortunately, you know, just as I read those statistics at the beginning of this message, much of the world today still places a higher value on men and a lower value on women. And as we saw from those statistics, this still leads to women being vulnerable and at risk of abuse and oppression in our world today. Now, how many of you have ever experienced um, the lifeboat ethics exercise, sometimes known as the lifeboat problem in school? Anybody do that? It kind of got developed, I think, in the late 70s or so, or the early 80s, and schools, some schools still use it today. Um, lifeboat ethics is basically a moral dilemma that is created by imagining a, a, a situation like what I'm going to give you here, okay? It can play out in a number of different ways, but this particular one, you're on a ship and it sinks, and uh, you along with seven people, so eight people climb into one lifeboat, but unfortunately, the lifeboat can only hold four people, not eight, and so it will soon sink if four people aren't ejected from the lifeboat. In the lifeboat, here are the eight people that are in the lifeboat, okay? A stay-at-home mom, a lifeguard, an 87-year-old man, two recently married young adults, a woman with Down syndrome, a boat's captain, or the boat's captain, and a really brilliant and good-looking bald Jewish pastor. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I wasn't counting on that. No, I'm just kidding. And so in this situation, you know, the group must decide who must leave the boat and on what values are those decisions made to either keep someone or reject someone. And of course, the exercise is intended to teach students how to think through situational ethics let me give you another situation that will challenge your ethics even more. Back in 1979, a book came out that was called, it's still called Sophie's Choice. And a movie came out four years later, the movie came out four years later, and Sophie was played by Meryl Streep. This story is a historical fiction, meaning that it has historical characters playing fictional roles. And so this scenario this story describes played out in some form or another in Nazi Germany, but this particular story is fictional. Sophie is a Polish Catholic who ends up being arrested and shipped off to a Nazi concentration camp, al camp along with her son and daughter. And so children uh, were not allowed to be in concentration camps. That's why, you know, when you watch the movie, It's a Beautiful Life, you know that movie? And the father tries to keep his son hidden the whole time. Uh, that's why, because kids were usually exterminated. And so um, they're not allowed in concentration camps, and so they're often ripped from their mother's arms, very emotional, dramatic, and, and taken away to be executed. A lot of them were. In this story, Sophie is in line with her young son and daughter are waiting to the selection process to which concentration camp they're going to end up. And Sophie knows what's going to happen to her children. She senses it. And so she pleads with a high-ranking German soldier that 
Uh, they're in line by mistake, since we're not Jewish, we're Catholics. We love Jesus, she says to him. He says, you love Jesus? Yes, we do. And so the, car, the guard acknowledges her plea and as a consolation offers Sophie a choice no parent would ever want to make. She can choose one child to be spared, but the other must be killed. And so distraught and in tears, Sophie tells the guard, I can't make that choice. Please don't make me make that choice. The guard then becomes angry that she's not making a choice, begins to shout, and take them both and kill them. And as, as they come to, to, the guard comes to pry both her children away from Sophie's arms, a fearful and desperate Sophie cries out, you can take my daughter, take my daughter. And her daughter is whisked away all the time looking back at her mom, crying hysterically, mama, mama. It's an intense scene. You can Google it, by the way. It's on YouTube. Sophie ends up surviving the concentration camp, but she's never able to be reunited with her son. She never finds him. And the guilt over choosing one child over the other continually haunts her. And eventually Sophie takes her life because the pain is just too much to bear. It's a very depressing story. And it has a lot of sexual situations, so I don't recommend watching it. But what I do recommend is to be driven by hope, not by fear. Fear causes us to do desperate things on the outside, but hope causes us to be at peace on the inside. God forbid that any of us would ever have to to be in that lifeboat situation or to make a choice like Sophie would have to make. No one, including me, knows what we would do in a situation like that. But I'd like to think that instead of choosing someone else to die, that I would have the inner peace to choose to die in their place because of the living hope that I have in this life of the guaranteed eternal life in the one to come. You see, when the wages of sin put a, a gun to our head and took us away to be executed, God stood up and said, shoot me instead. And I want to strive to lower myself in my marriage and all of my other relationships in order to lift up my wife and everyone else that I come in contact with. Think about what life would be if everybody lived this way, if we actually really got it. Think about how our government would be. Think about how warring countries would be, warring nations against each other. And I don't know about you, but I'm not even close. I'm not even anywhere close to being there. But that's my heart. And I know Andrew is committed to joining me in this quest. And I hope that you're all committed to joining us in this quest as well. We all have a living hope that's beyond this life. And that hope is our motivation to lower ourselves for God's sake and for everyone's sake as well. Let's pray together. Lord, this is, this is such counterintuitive stuff. It is not natural to lower yourself. And even the thought of submitting for, for many of us just pushes buttons because we've been raised in environments where we were mistreated in some way. And so the thought of submitting to anybody and to give up that kind of control is scary and even offensive. And so some of us need to be healed. We are fearful of frightening things. And Holy Spirit, you, we need to be touched by you. 
so that this hope that we have, this living hope that is preserved for us in heaven, kept for us, guaranteed, can do its work inside of our souls that we might have peace on the inside, to have the courage to lower ourselves on the outside. And so do your work in those of us here today that need that healing. We ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. And come.